to today's uh, talk by Dean Creelon. My name is Erhard Grafe. I'm a, I'm a PhD student over at the Center for Civic Media at the MIT Media Lab, and I have the honor of introducing um, uh, my friend and colleague here, Dean, uh, who is one of kind of the foremost uh, researchers on social media and social movements right now. Um, he's going to be talking about some excellent uh, kind of cutting cutting edge uh, uh, work he's been doing on the Internet Research Agency and um, and their activity on Twitter. Um, so let me just kind of do the, the background profile of, of Dean, uh, if, you, if you haven't had a chance to read it in the, uh, in, on the poster. So right now he's the Associate Professor in the School of Media and Journalism uh, at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and his work covers two major areas of scholarship. One is political expression through digital media, um, and two is data science and computational methods for analyzing large digital data sets. Um, he's authored or co-authored more than 30 journal articles, book chapters, and public reports, in addition to co-editing one scholarly book. He's also served as a PI um, on grants from Knight Foundation, Spencer Foundation, U.S. Institute of Peace. Not only that, he has also been developing research-grade software for several years. Um, some of you may have actually used it, um, including his tool Recal for intercoder reliability for content analysis, um, his TSM package on analyzing large-scale network data, uh, for social media, as well as um, another package for collecting data from Facebook at Peace Grade Public. Um, this is a really awesome dude who's been at the kind of fusion of thinking about how do we collect this data firsthand, um, and then think as a social scientist does and ask the right questions about that data and come away with you know, interesting answers about the phenomena that's really dominating kind of the moment of, of democracy. And so um, we are fortunate to have him here at MIT. Um, and it should be no, um, no signal to the quality of the speech that I have to go uh, grab my, uh, my infant um, at home right now um, for his talk. So welcome Dean Freeland. All right. Well, thank you, Earhart and Absentia. Um, <laughs> so uh, the presentation I'm going to give to you today is somewhat low on presentational polish. And uh, because I spent most of the time actually working on the presentation materials, because this is late breaking stuff, as I'll demonstrate. So what I'm going to talk about here is um, Russian disinformation, which, if you've been paying attention to the news, has been all over it lately. Um, I did some analysis of uh, one specific organization that produces this kind of content, known as the Internet Research Agency. Uh, I'm trying to do some, a couple of things here. I want to be able to um, do some cool empirical analysis of this data, but I also want to be able to push theory, which is a lot, which is something that not everyone who deals with this kind of intensive, trace, big data, social media stuff is really interested in, uh, but I am, because I feel that um, I want the research that I do to speak to the concerns uh, of people who are really trying to theorize about it, um, ask what it means and how it relates to other types of concepts, um, and also people who, everyday people who just encounter this, this um, kind of content uh, online as they sort of go about their daily civic and political lives. So uh, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk for maybe 40 to 45 minutes, and then hopefully there will be some time for conversation. Also, uh, coming up, if you read the, if you saw some of the promotional materials around this, there will be a live research portion of this, Tempting Fate. So please don't be like my undergrad staring at me blankly when I ask you for participation. So uh, that is forthcoming. You are uh, forewarned. Um, all right. So what comes to your mind when you think of trolls? Don't be like my undergrads. Uh, <laughs> Okay. So, what, what was that? Anger. Anger? Okay, what else? YouTube comment threads. Okay, I had the YouTube comment threads, right? Hatred. Yeah, hatred. Lots of anger, hatred, YouTube comment threads. Ignorance. Uh, ignorance, right. You might, you might picture somebody like this, <laughs> right? Or maybe if you're like more uh, on the sort of Reddit 4chan uh, tip, hopefully most, most of you aren't, you might picture this guy. Um, you may, if you have been following the IRA story, you might picture somebody like this. Um, this is uh, a woman named, a uh, Russian freelance jour journalist named uh, Ludmila Savchuk, who in 2015 went undercover as uh, an employee at the Internet Research Agency, which is a so-called troll farm whose purpose is to spread propaganda, Russian propaganda, uh, on social media around the world. Now, I call them a so-called troll farm because um, I don't think trolling is really the best analytical lens to apply to what they're doing. Um, 
scholars who study trolls um, tell us that most of them do it for the lulls, right? So they do it for uh, like Schadenfreude and um, you know digital sadism, you might call it, right? Um, the IRA are a different breed for a couple of reasons. First of all, they get paid, which like real trolls just only wish they could be, right? Uh, and secondly. Um, they don't discriminate quite as much. They do discriminate a little bit, but they don't discriminate quite as much in terms of uh, who they are trying to target. Um, and as I'll show later on in the presentation, they do target across a wide range of the ideological spectrum in their operations here in the States, although that degree of targeting is not uh, unlimited or complete. Um, so I felt like I needed it. So even though the word trolling has really been applied to this kind of activity a lot, um, in the media, I felt like I needed to get beyond that analytical concept to really get a handle on, uh, on what the IRA is doing. Um, so an obvious place to start here, conceptually, is with propaganda, and since it's become, it's been uh, a core concern of the study of communication, at least since the days of the Institute of Propaganda Analysis, that's 1937 to 1942, in case you forgot, um, and probably before. Right, goes goes all the way back. Goes back many many years. The term itself dates back from the uh, the sixth, seventeenth century, I believe. Um, some of you may be familiar with Herman and Chomsky's propaganda model of uh, mass media, which uh, tries to explain um, how mainstream news and other uh, media serve propagandistic uh, functions. Um, what we're seeing on social media is at once uh, more and less subtle than that. Yes. I need to move your mic. Because you moved it, and now it's just all fun. So I rolled on. Okay. I'd rather do that earlier rather than later. Probably right. a good thing to do. <laughs> this would be a good place. OK, thank you. Sorry. All right. Now, where was I? Um, so it's a much more and less subtle than sort of the propaganda model of uh, Herman and Chomsky here. So uh, you know, it's, uh, it's more subtle because we don't know who's behind the messages um, until long after they've already gone viral, if we ever find out, right? Um, they're also less subtle because the messages themselves are, many of them are very, very over the top, right? Extreme, they're outrageous, they're intended to provoke, um, almost to the way, and also the, some of the subtle uh, tells and solecisms that they have are, are so explicit um, and so direct that looking at it with the benefit of hindsight, you know, you kind of want to kick yourself for not realizing the ruse earlier or at least I did, you know. Um, you just like, wow, I couldn't tell that wasn't you know Russian propaganda, but you know, nobody expects Russian propaganda apparently. So um, that's uh, that's how that works. Um, so disinformation, uh, as many of you may be aware, is a very specific type of um, propaganda. Some uh, claim that the term was coined. It's uh, Russian in origin, but some claim that the term was coined by Stalin himself, although that itself may be. A point of disinformation, right? Um, so the, the term is um, sometimes confused with misinformation, which is like inadvertent, which is like incorrect information that is inadvertently spread. Um, but I, I find the distinction useful, and so I'm going to maintain it in my research and in this presentation. Um, so I define disinformation as uh, <clears throat> the surreptitious, purposeful distribution of messages intended to harm targets and/or benefit sources, right? Now. What's really important to mention here is that disinformation isn't necessarily always false, right? A lot of what the IRA said was true and verifiable. They linked to mainstream news organizations. The facts are not disputed. Um, you know, if anything, the, uh, the truth value of the IRA's messages is probably best captured by concepts like uh, reckless disregard uh, for the truth from libel law and uh, bullshit from epistemology, right? <laughs> um, you know, they'll say whatever works regardless of its truth or falsehood, right? So that's not the point. The point is, you know, does it sort of get the job done? And that's what they're interested in. Um, let me break down this um, definition a bit more uh, because it has um, these uh, five components or so, four or five, um, and I want to just go over each one of them because each one is actually really important. The last two are kind of interchange interchangeably um, optional, but you have to have at least one of them. So um, these are... Uh, the hidden source, um, the source knowledge and message purpose, four, yes. Um, the intention to harm targets and the intention to benefit source. Oh man, I missed one, nuts. But I, I, um, I think I, I think I had one here. Okay, so um, it probably goes without saying that disinformation doesn't work if the targets know 
uh, what the real source is, right? So this is why in the pre-digital age, um, most of the major forms disinformation took was, uh, one of the major forms that disinformation took was like forged memos, like real cloak and dagger stuff, right? So it was like, oh, here's a forged memo that uh, such and such high level operative or um, agent or you know, cabinet member is planning to knock over this or that country. And so in some ways it gains its currency from its uh, plausibility, but of course, nevertheless, in the details, uh, it is of course false. Um, and then when, what, but then of course, when the truth comes to light, the whole thing falls apart. Um, so a major part, uh, a major task of disinformation uh, lies in trying to prevent that from happening. Uh, so when we talk about source knowledge of message purpose, um, there's a real difference here, and the difference between dis misinformation really comes out because uh, with, in misinformation, people pass along content that they don't realize is problematic. Uh, but of course, disinformation uh, agents know full well uh, what their messages are intended to do, and um, what their messages are, the content. Every part of it that's true, every part of it that's false, and every part of it that lies in that great gray area right in the middle. Now, there is a lot of recent research in communication studies, uh, and some in political science, um, Brendan Nyhan at Dartmouth has been at the forefront of this, on misinformation and trying to correct it. However, this particular point, the source knowledge of message purpose, indicates that most um, solutions to the misinformation problem will not work with disinformation, right? So, a big part of misinformation is, you know, first of all, convincing people that they're incorrect, and then you can sort of work on the strategies that help them get over that. But when folks know that, that what they're doing is, is harmful and problematic all along, then you can't really use the same tactics to try to, um, to, try to counteract that. Um, and of course, that brings me to my next component, which is uh, intention to harm, okay? So disinformation isn't necessarily false, although it often is. Um, but if it's, not, uh, benefit, if it's not intended to uh, harm sources or, and or benefit sources, harm targets and or benefit sources, sorry, um, it doesn't really count um, as disinformation. Um, in this, uh, it, it bears some similarities to public relations, although uh, public relations isn't um, always surreptitious and actually uh, I would apply that more to the benefit source than the uh, harming um, targets, although PR can have both effects. Um, so speaking of which, uh, yes? Does, uh, in, your, in your opinion, does um, disinformation in today's social media landscape require misinformation in order to be broadly impactful? Um, that is a topic that I am going to look into in a future paper because uh, I'm just going to say this really quickly. The data set that I have access to is only the IRA tweet, IRA's tweets themselves. Um, but I think it, you know, uh, simple logic would dictate that you know, they can't spread this on their own. So uh, I think what I'm building, so what I'm building to, I think eventually in this line of research is sort of a disinformation, misinformation kind of like, uh, you know, inform well, I'd say message ecosystem, right? In which the origin is sort of disinformational and then it requires unwilling and unknowing participants to be able to spread it. I think you're absolutely right about that, yes. Uh, so getting back to intention to benefit source, so sometimes um, target harm and source benefit are the same. So this is often true in international relationship, right? Uh, you lose, I win. Um, and so when disinformation is used as a weapon of warfare, of course, between two rival countries, um, you know, there can be some uh, disagreement. Of, and so what's interesting about this, and you'll see this, and we can talk about this later if you're interested, is there can be some disagreement about the degree of harm that disinformation actually causes. So some people have said this, and I can look this up for you, uh, if you want the citations. And so some people say, well, you know, uh, what these folks are saying, I actually agree with. So like, who cares if they're foreign, you know, disinformation propaganda agents? Well, I care, but you know, apparently some people don't. And so if what is being said is functionally indistinguishable from what like real people actually say, then there are questions about the degree of harm, but, um, but there is that intention there. And certainly the intention to benefit source uh, as well. Um, so there are some other uh, related terms you may have heard that are, that, um, that also that some of this work goes under. There is uh, influence operations and psychological operations, which of course has a, a major military um, connotation. And um, interestingly enough, the U.S. government uh, readily admits to being engaged in influence operations, psychological operations. Uh, they do not readily admit to being involved in disinformation. So the connotation is a sort of a big factor there. Uh, active measures is, is a term that um, is closely associated with. Um, clandestine um, Soviet propaganda from the 60s through the 80s. Um, 
of which this information is only one, but that's where the whole you know forged memo thing comes in. You know, leaked information. One of the major aspects of the active measures was the uh, myth that the U.S. government created the uh, HIV virus, which is still believed by many many people. But um, Soviet uh, 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 disinformation agents played a major role in distributing um, and spreading that that uh, that rumor. Um, then there's uh, the Soviet term maskarova, which is um, Russian for uh, uh, disguise. Uh, and that's more of a military term. It's associated with Russian military tactics. It includes things uh, in addition to disinformation as uh, physical camouflage, official government actions intended to mislead enemies. And so um, you can also look at disinformation as one of the items under that umbrella. Um, and then, of course, there is the more recent concept of computational propaganda, which is a term that's been uh, you know, popularized by um, uh, Phil Howard, who was also my, on my disk committee, full disclosure, and his colleague mm -hmm. Sam, Sam Woolley uh, um, at uh, Oxford. And uh, that really refers to propaganda that's created on social media, uh, often algorithmically or by cybernetically enhanced individuals. individuals. Um, now, of course, not all computational propaganda is state-sponsored. Um, and if you know Phil's work, you know that he also casts a pretty wide net in terms of what he includes in that. Um, but there's a strong argument to be made that the IRA also fits into that category. Um, so in my read of this literature, there's really three main types of research. So first, you've got, um, well, first of all, I want to say the research in this area is actually very sporadic. So if you know of like thriving research in this area that I don't know about, please let me know, because what I found is just very, it's bits and pieces uh, uh, around. And maybe it goes under, under other names uh, besides the ones that I showed on the previous slide. So um, you've got uh, sort of purely conceptual and definitional work. So you've got a, a lot of papers that are like, here's what this, this information is. Here's what active measures are. Here's you know, what Mascarova is. Um, and uh, so that's, that's really great as sort of a backdrop, but it's, it's not empirical. Uh, and they use sort of examples, but they don't really uh, uh, get into it very far. Um, then we've got uh, case studies, lots of case studies, um, where, they'll, where they'll zero in on, on one incident or one sort of small piece of this and, and really, really get uh, into the nitty gritty of that. Uh, but a lot of those are purely descriptive. A lot of those are not um, peer reviewed. They're the sort of reports that are issued by think tanks, that sort of thing. Um, and then the last one that we've started to see emerge um, in the past few years is uh, data-driven computational analyses of uh, the social media traces of a lot of this type of uh, stuff. And so. Uh, Phil Howard and Sam Woolley have been at the, the forefront of this, putting out lots of reports from uh, their computational propaganda project. Um, and so the advantage of that is they're able to circulate it and get it out there uh, into the world. Uh, but it's not peer-reviewed, and it doesn't really build theory. Uh, and so and also, you also have a, a great degree of methodological sophistication, which you know, plays really well with the information science and computer science crowds, uh, not as much with the social science crowds. Um, so now. I don't mean to claim that this is everything we need to know, but uh, one thing that I think would really help move us to the next step in our exploration of disinformation um, is some baseline evidence of, you know, and some, some broad scale and baseline evidence of who is being targeted, right? Because not everyone is at equal uh, risk of being targeted at disinformation dis uh, deployment. Um, and by analyzing the assumed identities of the social media accounts that are associated with disinformation, we can start to understand, um, as I'll demonstrate, who their intended audiences are, right? What is being said, which perhaps goes without saying, right? The content of what it is, what it is and what it isn't. Um, and then, of course, which identities and tactics are most successful, right? Because, um, you know, the IRA, as I'll demonstrate, is nothing if not, you know, inventive. They tried a whole lot of different things, and only a few things actually worked. And so one of the uh, aims of this research is to try to figure out, in terms of message distribution, using that as a dependent variable, trying to discover uh, exactly how that works. That piece, I'm still in the middle of. I've got some very preliminary data on that. Uh, but the other two, I've sort of gotten a little further into. So the Internet Research Agency. Um, uh, I'm using them as, a, as, as sort of a, a test case here. And the idea is that research that comes after this will be able to build on it. Um, this building is uh, their office in St. Petersburg, right? This is a job. People show up. They work 12 hours a day pumping out all sorts of propaganda, or they did. Right to before they were indicted by Robert Mueller, but we'll get to that. Um, so um, just a little bit of history here. Uh, information on the IRA is slowly dribbled out into the West, uh, starting in 2014 when the first um, news article was written about them by a journalist at BuzzFeed. Uh, there was a very popular article written in 2015 by Adrian Chen for the New York Times uh, that really, really got into to what they do and how they work. Um, but until recently, it was very difficult to study 
their actual content because we didn't know exactly who, they, who the accounts were. Um, now, uh, on October 1st of 2017, uh, no, sorry, November 1st, <laughs> excuse me, of, uh, well, actually, actually, let me back up. In October of 2017, um, a Russian magazine called RBC wrote a, uh, an article in Russian that really uh, revealed a lot of details that were previously not known about the IRA, including some of their handles. And so uh, that article published maybe 20, a couple dozen, maybe 20, 30 handles. Um, and that was out there. I, Google Translate of it is half decent, so I was able to like get the gist of it. Um, and then on November 1st, the US House Intelligence Committee released 2,705, 2, 2,752, 2752, yes, uh, IRA-associated Twitter handles. Um, I was very busy that evening. Uh, so try, trying to pull that out of the PDF that they posted. We really have to talk about the data deployment, folks. Uh, but uh, so they, they released that, and so um, you know that sort of set everybody who had been interested in this, uh, I'm sure, uh, scrambling toward their pre-existing data sets because um, Twitter and Facebook, uh, which was the other major social media platform that the IRA infiltrated, uh, had scrubbed all of the content of this off of their sites. So there's no way to get to it, um, and uh, and all that was was uh, was gone. So. Uh, and of course, there was a Mueller indictment um, a couple weeks ago, and uh, that has really sort of pushed this story forward and kept it in the public eye. Um, you know, there, there's still being stories being written about it, which you know, in this era, like lasting beyond the 24-hour news cycle is like a huge achievement. So I'm really shocked that uh, that they're still talking about this. Um, um, so let me just go over a few basic facts. I, I need to talk about my data in a, in a bit, but um, so they've been active since summer 2013, at least since then. Um, they have a budget of uh, annual budget of 1.25 million U.S. dollars, so you know, like pretty cheap, right? Like just a just a rounding error in the uh, Kremlin operating budget, really. Um, something somewhere between 80 and 600 employees, bit of a <laughs> bit of a confidence interval there. Uh, so there was some conflict, conflicting accounts on that, and uh, they may have shrunk uh, recently, especially after the election. Um, it said that they required a minimum of 100 comments per day per employee, so you know they got busy. Uh, Cash bonuses for provoking strong reactions. So you know you really troll them into to getting into it. That was one thing that they were that the bosses were really interested in. They trafficked in hoaxes, outrageous opinions, and verified facts. So just a nice, <coughs> wonderful epistemological slurry of all sorts of stuff in there, right? Um, they had targets all over the world: U.S., U.K., Ukraine, Russia, you name it, right? They did it. Um, and so uh, you know, and they're also one of many operations. We don't know how many. Um, this is one that's verified. It's been a lot of work done on this, and so we're fairly sure that the folks that are involved in this were actually involved in the disinformation we distribution thereof. Can we verify where that budget comes from? Yeah, so some of the, um, the news articles that have been done by uh, independently operating journalists have been able to substantiate this mm -hmm. with the help of, uh, I believe with the help of documents provided by um, folks like the uh, uh, journalist who was actually a mole in their organization. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's been independent, ver independently verified multiple times. That, that it comes from the Kremlin? Yeah. Yeah, so they're so they are they are they are a company that is basically they're like government contractors, right? They're a company that's paid by the Kremlin. Yes. Do we have a sense of the definition of strong reactions? Does that just mean hostile or numerous or numerous and hostile? Uh, I just I just pulled that piece right out of one of the articles. Um, I, I had to look uh, to try to find that. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of elaboration on that. I would guess uh, volume would be a factor there. Uh, I don't know how much like sentiment analysis they got into, but like sheer volume would might might justify that. But I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Um, more facts, so we know they were, they were active on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, also Tumblr, which is not on here. Um, uh, let's see, 2,752 uh, IRA-linked Twitter accounts on November 1st, 7, uh, 2017, all scrubbed prior to the release of those, um, of those accounts. Uh, Twitter claims that it's ID'd um, uh, 3,814 IRA accounts since January 18th, so that's a that's an increase of over 1,000 from what uh, the, the House Intelligence Committee released on November 1st. Um, they also emailed, did anybody, did anybody get one of these emails um, from interacting with IRA content, Twitter folks? Oh, one person? Great. Um, and so uh, Twitter emailed or messaged somehow 677,775 users who interacted with IRA content. However, that number only counts engagements, that is like clicks or retweets or likes or um, replies not views, and so the actual number of people who saw it is probably much, much greater. Um, and uh, Twitter also announced in their blog post uh, uh, where they discussed this that they had 175,993 IRA tweets. However, the data set that I'm about to describe actually contains more than that. So um, that may indicate that either Twitter's wrong or the data set is wrong. We need to figure that out. Um, so 
As I mentioned, all data uh, uh, was removed from the sites as it was discovered. And so researchers who really want to study this have three options. They can draw their own pre-existing data sets for IRA content, which I did. I've got some of this in a, a data set that I'm going to use in a future project. I'm actually not going to talk about that today. Um, secondly, they can scrape the Internet, internet Archive, which I can help you with because I've done it. Um, but it, it took me a while to figure out, so I don't want anybody to have to go through that again. Um, in the Internet Archive, I found about 7,000 tweets after I deduplicated, so they've got some stuff. Um, and the nice thing about that is it's not going away. Um, and then finally, there is the <clears throat> NBC data set, which is very interesting. So on Valentine's Day, NBC News, of all places, releases 200,000, over 200,000 IRA tweets from um, sources that they are unwilling to name. Uh, they, 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 just, they put it literally in the middle of the, the uh, a, a C, they post a CSV in the middle of this article. Um, and so that's where it is. Um, and so uh, I've looked at it, and I've looked at other IRA data sets, and I'm pretty sure it's genuine. There are a couple other things I want to check out. Uh, you know, they, in the article they mentioned, they're like, well, the sources realize that technically posting this is violating terms of, terms of service, so we don't want to tell you who they are. But the data looked pretty good. I, I verified um, uh, by looking at some of the um, duplicate uh, tweet IDs that they've got in there. So at least some of it is, is, uh, is, is uh, jibes with what I've got. Um, unfortunately, the data are a little bit messy. It's clearly been cobbled together from multiple sources. There, there are some fields missing, so I've had to work, work around that. But um, this is probably your best bet if you really want to study this stuff. Um, and that's what I've been, so I've been working on it for, gosh, what is it like, Valentine's Day was two weeks ago? So yes, but over the last two weeks, using some techniques that I had uh, refined in working with some of the smaller data sets before, and uh, that is the content that I'm going to present in the empirical portion of this uh, talk. Um, so here are some basic descriptives, right? So uh, total number 2752, um, the combined data set between the Internet Archive and uh, the MBC data set is 439 unique users. Um, that is 16% of U.S. House Intel uh, accounts. And so this is just really a, a, a very large portion, not, I mean, a, 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 not even a large minority, but like, you know, it's sizable in and of itself, but only a small portion of the total that were actually detected. Um, there, uh, in the NBC data set, there were over 202,000 um, tweets, unique tweets. Uh, in the Internet Archive data set, there were a little over 7,000. Uh, when I looked at only the English language ones, which I used um, using the uh, Google uh, language detective, detecting algorithm port for Python, and I also pulled out uh, all duplicates, I came to 194,215 tweets. And these are posted uh, from July 14, ending right at about the end of September 2017, so spanning over three years. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to know where the holes in this data are, but um, you know, it's what we got. Um, so, when we're trying to look at these specific research questions of who do they target, what did they say, and what worked, um, to look at uh, who did they target, I'm doing some, some content analysis and a little bit of qualitative elaboration of that. Uh, for what did they say, I'm doing some computational description, which I'll talk about in my uh, descriptive data slides and also some, a little bit of LDA, which is fun. Um, and then, in terms of what worked, um, I got to the regression part, I'm still working on the nested part. Um, I was literally working on that last night, so uh, I got a little bit of that for you, but then on the plane I thought of a much better way to do it, so um, that, you know, you're, you're gonna get that sometimes. Um, so let me just get into to showing you some of the descriptive stuff here. So this is IRA activity by month. Um, this should not be at all surprising to you. Uh, you can see that there is a tiny bit of activity starting uh, in the summer of 2014. Um, and just only very small relative spikes until the summer of 2016 when they really ramped their activity up uh, for the 2016 election. Um, but as you might not expect, one thing that might be a little bit less predictable here is that the tapering off after the election is not immediate. So there's a much gentler um, ratcheting down of activity that we can see here. And also keeping in mind that this is not everything um, that they did, but uh, of the data set, you can see that uh, there's a little bit of a tapering off and then by the summer of 2017, it's pretty much cratered. So that's, uh, that's all there is there. Um, it's also instructive to take a look at account creation dates over time, right? So you'll notice that there are a very small number of account creation dates that actually predate um, the uh, supposed uh, origin time of the IRA, which was the summer of 2013. Now, there were some successor organizations to the IRA, and they're not the first, um, according to some of the reporting on this, they're not the first you know, uh, disinformation 
uh, uh, agency or operation that's paid for by the Russian government. So some of these may have been um, accounts that were associated with some of those predecessor organizations. I'm not sure yet. Um, but you do see a major spike during the summer of 2013 uh, and um, another one during the, the sort of late spring and early summer of uh, 2014. After that, you, know, you see some, some smaller numbers here. Uh, you know, almost actually doesn't even reach 20 after that uh, summer of uh, 2014. So the vast majority of these accounts haven't been created uh, years before that spike during the summer of 2016. Uh, let me just really quickly, I'm going to go into to some of the research questions now. I'm going to talk about some of my methods really quickly. So uh, a little bit of a non-standard content analysis where I had uh, my research assistants coded each screen name and five uh, randomly selected uh, tweets. And they came up with the, co the categories inductively. Um, all RAs did all of the coding. What I'm going to present to you now is um, a preliminary analysis of two of the RAs. And so what I did was I simply said, if those two agreed, then we're going to count that as a hit. They're all binary um, co uh, categories. Um, if they both agreed that it was absent or they disagreed, then we don't count that at all. So at least two individuals agreed that, this, that these categories were present for all of the hits that I'm about to show you. Um, the categories were not mutually exclusive, so uh, it could belong to, to more than one. Um, and of course, the uh, yeah, final categories were um, uh, decided by majority judgment. I've got more coders, but they're not fast. So uh, I, I just went with these two for this analysis. Uh, so the user categories I came up with were, uh, let me just read these across the bottom. You've got pro-Trump from the right, anti-Trump from the left, uh, news outlets, black activists, pro-Trump from the left, anti-Trump from the right, fake news, and uh, Islam slash Middle East. And so the, this, this is um, proportionally. Uh, so uh, this is a proportion of all users marked as, ad, as of, all, of all of the users that they categorize, all 439 is marked as occupying each uh, category. So as you can see, pro-Trump right is um, the biggest one. Um, secondly, you've got anti-Trump left. Uh, then you've got news outlets um, at a little over 30. Uh, black activists, I think, are exactly 30. Um, not a whole lot of pro-Trump left. Uh, slightly less anti-Trump right. A little bit of fake news, and part of this has to do with the difficulty of actually spotting fake news in the at the wild. I just taught an undergrad class at this. People are much, much worse than they think. Uh, it's like Dunning Kruger running wild. Um, and then uh, uh, not a, uh, just a few of them that were attempting to pretend as though they were, you know, Muslim or Islamic or or, or something of that nature. Say what now? This app mentions. What does it mean? It's targeted. Oh, right. Yeah. So um, the idea here um, is that if you're if you're acting as though you're a pro-Trump Republican, that is an indicator of who you're trying to target. Right? If you're acting as though you're anti-Trump left, that's who you're trying to speak to. That's the sort of inference that I'm making here. Um, same with black activism, right? Like, so if you're saying, like, we should really vote for Bernie, which is the thing they said, um, that the idea is that, that that's, the, that's the community of the group that you're trying to target. I managed to pull some of, the, some of these tweets off of, the, off of the Internet Archive for you. This is Pamela Moore, one of the most popular conservative tweeters. Uh, so you can see some of the tweets here. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, most of the videos and images were not saved. I, I managed to get the actual um, uh, uh, icon for her, the, uh, uh, the image that she uses as her sort of uh, profile image. Um, you can see some of these, right? May the next dead be socialism, um, you know, hating on feminists, right? How to embarrass Antifa, uh, Trump is great. So you see some of this stuff might not be necessarily distinguishable from the average Trump su um, supporter. I'll let you be the judge of that. But this is just a little sample of some of the pro-Trump stuff uh, that uh, one of the most popular accounts tweeted out. You can also take a look at the, the, uh, the reactions here, 131, 162 retweets, uh, retweets in the 200, some replies, a bunch of uh, likes. So clearly they're getting some, uh, some interactions uh, around this. Um, let's take a look at the anti-Trump left. Uh, this is Robbie Delaware. Um, I actually had a really hard time finding good examples of anti-Trump left. And part of, the, part of the thing is I wanted to show it in its natural context. So there's more of this stuff that I had in the actual data set, but that's just plain text. So I wanted to show you some. And so this is kind of like weak tea a little bit. Like it's talking about how great Evan McMullen is. And then it's this uh, tweeting an article about uh, that's sort of negative about Trump from the Washington Post. So like not nearly as bomb throwing and sort of, you know, fiery as the conservative stuff. But, you know, you can recognizably anti-Trump, you know. So um, maybe not necessarily... Uh, you know, uh, 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 from the left, but certainly, certainly um, not this sort of neg uh, uh, anti, not the sort of um, anti-Trump right that you saw in the Never Trump region, where people said, "Oh, Trump's not really a conservative, so that's why you shouldn't vote for him." So, yes. On the slide before, when you showed the creation of um, the accounts, or the one like prior to that, um, no, sorry, I was a little. I was just curious um, for those. 
like during the creation of those um, different accounts, were they active or were they just went inactive until 2016 when you said the, the like those tweets that were prior to that? Right. Like, one up, like what, what was the activity of the accounts that were created? Yeah, so I would need to look at that. Um, I, I mean, obviously, if you look at this one, activity jumped a lot, but I, I, like, I couldn't tell you right now, I'd have to look at the data, whether they were just sitting idle and then they just sort of spun up you know, at that time. So clearly some of the accounts were doing something, but um, in terms of tweets per day, I, I would need to go back and look at that. Um, let's see, where was I? Oh, yes, Robbie Delaware. Um, also, you could take a look at this bottom tweet. Um, it's sort of a tweet about Brian Cranston being in a Taco Bell commercial that's really old. So they try to get into some of the pop culture stuff, and we'll see some of that um, a little bit later as well. So here's an example of a fake news outlet. Um, well, <clears throat> let me back up. Not an outlet that distributes fake news, but uh, or maybe or possibly that could be the, tr the truth, but an outlet that is attempting to look like a real news outlet. So you can see they've got a sort of a generic kind of handle, Online Cleveland, um, a description probably cribbed from some actual TV station somewhere, right? Like breaking news, weather, traffic, and more from Cleveland. Like sounds kind of you know legit. A um, couple details pop out here. So firstly, firstly, some of the, the writing's a little odd. Like you know, uh, what is it? Uh, felon, heartless Cleveland heartless felon member. Uh, unless the heartless felons is the name of their gang, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, you know, also like for those of you who've taken journalism classes, that's editorializing, right? You'd be that's something you teach in journalism 101 not to do. So um, you know, there are some tells in here. Some of the, the the linguistic constructions are a little bit odd. But if you don't see, you know, the Russian disinformation coming, that's not really what you're going to assume that this is. And so you can tell by the 13.8 um, uh, 13.8 thousand followers they've got that uh, lots of people saw fit to uh, to follow this. And also, um, a preliminary analysis uh, uh, indicates that the vast majority of these followers are not other IRA accounts. So they're not trying to artificially boost their own um, their own numbers there. Uh, here's one of the black activist ones called For My, Swap, for my Squad. Um, you'll notice that three out of the four tweets, all but the last one, are about how terrible cops are, right? So bad things the cops are doing. Um, that's what this account was really uh, aimed at. <clears throat> uh, you can also notice that uh, they're using kind of hip-hop inspired, you know, uh, screen name, got the four, the uh, squad being a colloquial term uh, that's used there. Um, it's uh, it, it, they're sort of following this, the the BLM stereotype that they're all super and, and uh, vehemently anti-cop. Um, the links themselves are actually real as well. Uh, they go to a site called uh, the Free Thought Project that is of uncertain um, provenance. I don't know how true that is, but uh, the links are still up, um, and, I don't, and I'm pretty sure that the, I don't actually don't think that those are IRA generated, uh, but they're still around if you want to check those out. All right. So let me move on a little bit. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit more computational description here. So these are, these are the top hashtags that move into what they said. Um, so, the t so the red ones are sort of conservative-leaning hashtags. The gray ones are, uh, if not neutral, they're not explicitly left or right. And the purple one is just Trump. That's me being a little bit charitable in terms of saying, well, if you want to talk about Trump, it could be positive or negative. Um, but seven out of 10 of these are very clearly uh, conservative in terms of uh, their valence and their political leaning here. So, um, and uh, just by way of explanation, TCOT is top conservatives on Twitter. Uh, MAGA is MAGA. Um, PJNet is Patriot Journalist Network. Uh, CCOT is Christian conservatives on Twitter. Um, and the rest of those, I think, are more or less uh, self-explanatory. So here's where they were sort of spending a lot of their time engaging uh, with these um, kinds of uh, uh, hashtags. Um, so most reference users, and so references includes retweets, mentions, and replies. And so you've got a little bit more diversity here. Donald Trump is number one, Clinton second. Uh, Blickr is sort of a, a, a black or African American oriented news source. Uh, that account is still up, so I assume it's not IRA. Um, so you've got At Midnight is a really interesting one. People watch this show, At Midnight, Comedy Central show. So some of these IRA accounts are trying to post jokes and stuff to the At Midnight uh, account. So they've got all these hashtags where people try to post jokes. They, they talk about the funniest ones on TV, I guess. Um, and so uh, really good shows to show how they were trying to engage with pop culture here. Uh, you've also got a uh, conservative, uh, conservatexian, who is uh, an actual conservative whose, whose account is still up. Um, POTUS, which could have gone, the reason why that's purple is, you know, uh, pre-inauguration it was Obama, post it was um, Trump, of course, and then a few news outlets, uh, Fox News, CNN, not Prison Planet. But um, you know, you see those uh, as well. Uh, so let me just talk through, talk a little bit about how I did my topic modeling here. 
Um, I had I, I aggregated tweets by user first because um, you know uh, doing topic modeling on very short text is very difficult. Uh, aggregating by by user um, had some really nice uh, uh, results as I'll show you. Um, stem bit using LibreOffice slash Chrome Stemmer, which works better than the default one and the software I was using. Uh, had a custom stop word list that I removed stuff from. I removed very short and very long words. Most of the very long words were like URLs, and so I got rid of those. Um, I generated five models for each of five Ks, um, Ks 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13, and that was just based on qualitative analysis. Uh, lower than five, most of the topics were kind of mixed together, they didn't make a whole lot of sense. Above 13, there were um, a lot of duplicate um, uh, uh, topics. And so when you do the math, it ends up being 225 topics. Uh, and so what I did was I had my research assistants read each topic and assign an inductive mutually exclusive category. Um, I did mutually exclusive here, uh, whereas I didn't before because the topics are so short. I only looked at the top 10 um, highest probability terms for each one. Uh, they also did a coherence rating. And the idea behind that is the, the, the extent to which the terms matched up with the, the theme that they chose. So if they were all related, they would give it a 10. If all the terms were unrelated to one another, they'd give it a 1, and then so on and so forth, um, up and down the scale. Uh, and so I wanted to do this to be able to use all the models rather than saying, this is definitely the K that's the best K, and going with that. Uh, so let me just show you the results of this really quickly. So uh, the categories, let me just go over these. So we've got election 2016, which is number one, purple, that's you know left and right. Conservative politics is second. Hashtag games, and so this would be like trending topics and also the at midnight stuff. Um, black activist uh, terms uh, or uh, topics were after that. Music podcast film was strangely big. Uh, news categories, which were which were things like news, sports, weather, you know, uh, business, that sort of thing, and then a, a small number. This also starts at 0.5. Uh, so, um, and that's uh, ISIS, uh, Syria, and Middle East. Actually, I think this might be the wrong chart. Oh. Um, no, sorry, that's 0.05. No, this is the right chart. Sorry. Um, yeah, break down a second over there. So let's take a look at some of these topics. Um, election 2016. You can catch the uh, theme there. Trump, politics, Clinton. This is the, these are the top. Uh, 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 10 most likely terms on this uh, topic. Clinton, Donald, News, relatively nonpartisan. These are terms that both sides would probably use. The conservative politics is distinguished by its um, uh, hashtags and terms that are definitively associated with the right hand side of the aisle. TCOP, PJNet, Trump for President, Wake Up America, Refugee, Cruise, 2A, Islam Kills, uh, definitively right wing with this topic. Uh, let me show you just a couple more of these. We've got uh, black activists. Uh, the, the terms here were things like uh, black, Black Lives Matter, police, white cop, uh, P2, which is a, a progressive hashtag, racism, black Twitter, racist, kill. Um, probably should have stemmed those two terms. Didn't work on that. Um, hashtag games. And so here's what the hashtag games looks like. Christmas aftermath, 2016 in four words. I have a right to know. Secondhand gifts. It's risky to. Sometimes it's OK to. So it's like fill in the blank. Not explicitly political, but allows the IRA to sort of get at some of those folks that aren't paying quite as much attention to politics. Um, at least that's my theory. Um, let me just really quickly show you this thing on like mean topic uh, model coherence. Uh, basically, this was the extent to which the terms in these topics actually matched up with each of these, or the, sub the subjective uh, range here. And so um, this is just the average uh, topic model coherence for all of the ones that were labeled as uh, election 2016. So that had the highest topic model coherence with almost nine terms out of 10 matching uh, in each of these topics. Conservative politics is second. Uh, music podcast film is third, and so on and so forth. Um, news categories is actually the least coherent one. And so basically that was a topic that was often mixed with other stuff, but uh, the ones that were solidly um, the most and uh, had the word color currents and, sh and showed the most focus or election, or the sort of explicitly political ones, at least the first two, and then you get into music, podcast, film, and then black activists. All right, we have come to the live data analysis portion of this talk. All right, so um, it turns out that one of the nice ways of um, analyzing sentiment here is not using sort of explicitly you know, crazy sentiment analysis algorithms, but simply looking at the uh, most common hashtags that were posted in association with various keywords, and so. If you'll allow me, I'll get, I'm going to go ahead and give you a demonstration here. Uh, so let me just show you this real fast. Let's see if we can do this. Oh, there's my code. Yes, I use idle, and I'm, I'm definitely proud of it. All right, let's see here. Come on, let's work. Okay, so this is, let me move this over here. Hopefully this will pop up. Whoop, oh, there it is. Hang on. It's terribly exciting. Um, let's see here. Why is this thing not moving? Hang on. <laughs> Oh, that's why. That's why it's not moving. Oh, come on. Auto 
it'll do this to me. Hang on one second. Oh, there it is. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah, I know, right? Like it, it works. It works perfectly, you know. On, you know what? Hang on a second. I'm actually going to mirror this for just a second. I'm going to flip this. So let me just duplicate real quick. We're going to do that. Oops, sorry. I'm going to duplicate. Did I do that? No. Hang on. Uh, we're going to revert. Is that? Oh, now you're seeing what I'm seeing. Great. Okay, perfect. So let's see if this pops up. All right, there we go. So let's see if this will allow me to um, enter a keyword. So I'm just going to start with a couple. Uh, the first one I'm going to start with is Trump. So let's see if this does it for me. Oh, really? Wow. So that managed to crash my system. Excellent. So that's, that's terribly exciting. Um, that, that has never happened to me before. So that's, uh, you know, there's your live data analysis. Um, so uh, what I was going to show you was, um, what is that? Is this doing this? OK, yes. Yeah, so what I was going to show you was basically an example um, of where if you type in uh, keywords that are relevant to the election, um, Trump, for example, will turn up a lot of pro-Trump hashtags. Hillary turns up a lot of uh, anti-Hillary uh, hashtags. Um, interestingly, I was also going to show um, uh, terms like liberal and conservative, which if you type in conservative, there's lots of different sort of conservative issues. Liberal is a lot of anti-liberal stuff. So it's a nice way of sort of, of, of doing this. Um, Let's see if my system will pop back up and we can tempt fate again. Um, yeah, I, I um, you know, you'd think that just hooking up the the uh, the uh, screen here wouldn't uh, wouldn't cause such uh, such issues, but we'll um, I'll try this one more time, and if it crashes again, we're definitely done. All right, if it'll just give me one second, because I thought I thought it was, pretty, you know, it's, it's so great because you're like when you're planning this, like in your office, you're like, oh man, this is gonna go so great. Then you pull it out and you're like, oh gosh, not really. All right, let's see here. Um, we'll see. So we're gonna do. All right, so let's put that back up and see if we can do this without crashing the entire system. All right, let's see here. So I'm going to pull that up. And let's see here. All right, so we're going to do that. Nice, it's right there, so we're going to try this. And pull this back up. There we go, so let's see here. Come on, don't crash. Ah, there it is. All right, there we go. So there you go. Uh, see, so Trump, Trump politics, Trump, Trump 16, 2014 for president. Uh, Trump train, never Hillary. Now I'll do Hillary. All right, there we go. Uh, never Hillary, Hillary Clinton, crooked Hillary, Trump for president. Things more trusted than Hillary. Very nice. Uh, politics, TCOT. Let me just expand this real quick. I don't want to tempt fate, but um, can I have some suggestions from the audience? Yes. Bernie. Bernie. All right. Show me Bernie. All right. Feel the burn. Bernie or bust. Never Hillary. Bring Bernie back. Uh, but those, note that the numbers are much lower than you saw. You're in the hundreds, high hundreds for Hillary Clinton here. You, you, you top out at 64. So some pro Bernie stuff, but a lot less of that. What else we got? Mueller. Uh, I actually don't think there's going to be a whole lot of that, but um, because the data set ends at um, so we've got any more stuff. Nothing. 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 So this, the data set ends in um, September uh, 2017. So, uh, and, and also the, um, the activity was rationing down at that point. So there probably wouldn't be a whole lot of that. What about FBI? FBI. Let's try that. Yeah. FBI, politics, MAGA, TCOT, Clinton. Uh, nothing too interesting. Yes? Crimea. Oh, that's good. Let's see if they've got any of that stuff in here. <laughs> Crimea. Nothing. Access Hollywood. <laughs> I'll just try Access. How about that? No D no D D A P L. Okay, um, we'll just do that. No D A P L. Okay, so uh, they were also um, engaging around uh, no D P no D A P L. Okay, let's try. Uh, let's try. We'll just try black. How about that? We'll just yeah, try that. <laughs> so yeah, so they were engaged around some of these black issues: Black Lives Matter, Black Twitter. Trump, Oscar has no color, Black History Month. Blacks for Trump, interestingly. Uh, I think both of them were involved with that, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, you got some of that as well. Uh, what was the other one, Planned Parenthood? Yeah. yeah. We'll just do plan, see if that comes up with anything. Yeah, a couple. Defund PP, Planned Parenthood, pro-life. Say what? 
Sorry, say, 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 what did you say? Putin. 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 Let's see if we got Putin. Putin, okay. So Trump's favorite headline, Trump. You know, they actually don't talk a whole lot about Russia in here. We can, we can type in Russia. I'll just type Russia in just to see what they say. Um, Russia, news, Syria, MAGA, Trump, Russia, uh, Russian, you know, so you got a couple of things there. Standing Rock, and Macron. Uh, okay, we'll do, uh, I'll do Standing, I'll do Standing Rock, then I'll do Macron. We'll do a couple more. We'll do Standing, see if that comes up with anything. So a little bit, so, so no DPL stuff, so a little bit of that stuff. And then the other one was uh, Macron. Now, I did filter that for English, so there, probably, there might not be a whole lot of Macron what stuff. About immigrants? Immigrants, okay, so we'll try, Im I'll just do the singular. I'll just do I'll, I'll do, I'll stem it. We'll do immigrants, because that'd be immigrate immigrants, all of that. Okay, so you've got some of these. Um, immigrants, TCOT, Trump, a lot of Trump stuff. So clearly not, you know, pro probably not. Ooh, DACA, what's up with DACA? Let's see here. Nothing, nothing. Soros, okay, let's see what we got for Soros. Okay, George Soros, a little bit of Soros stuff, not a ton. Um, yes? The word fake. Okay, we'll try the word fake. Oh, that's good. Fake news. Uh, next fake Trump victim. Fake Oktoberfest facts. Uh, Trump. Uh, emails. Let's try emails. We'll do that. Oh, a lot of those. Podesta emails, Hillary's emails, WikiLeaks. Uh, Fox. Say what? Fox. Fox. Like F-O-X? Yeah. F-O-X. Uh, TCOT, a little bit of stuff. Uh, Hannity, GOP, CCOT, Trump, Fox News. Yes? Ask your witch hunt. Uh, I'll just do which, how about that? We'll do, because that would capture anything with... Yeah. Not a lot, not CNN. a lot on that one. CNN, let's try CNN. Okay, uh, uh, fake news is number uh, four on that one. Uh, CNN State of the Union, birtherism, crooked <laughs> Hillary, uh, MAGA. Um, I'll, I'll just do a couple more, to, yeah, uh, we'll do one, one more and then I'll do a couple more to the end, yes. In the back, yes. NRA? NRA, actually, yeah. you know what's a really good one for this is just gun, I'll just do <laughs> gun. Well, I, I, we'll do both, it's fine, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't time. NRA, um, 2A, now plowing. Um, a lot of conservative stuff. Rap station radio. Uh, I might want to double check if that's uh, the right thing. Hip hop and rap, I'm not sure. You know, the NRA, I don't know how much rap they listen to, but uh, we'll have to find that out. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah, right. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do gun. You see a lot of gun stuff, right? Guns for NY, prayers for California. This was um, after a, 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 a I'm actually, I actually forget what that's, what that's in reference to. Um, San Bernardino, right, Garden City shooting, PJ Net, gun control. This is another big one for them. All right, the last two I'm going to do really quickly are uh, liberal and conservative, which I think are pretty cool to try. So we'll do liberal first. So a lot of sort of anti-liberal um, things, liberal logic, liberals, uh, Tea Party, liberal, uh, and a lot of conservative stuff mixed in as well. Now let's look at the, conser let's look at the contrast. First of all, remember that first number of 136 so the, uh, in terms of the, the volume here. So we'll do conservative. Tiv, spell that right. So a little bit higher, but conservative Tea Party news, politics, but certainly much more conservative uh, terms uh, with that um, keyword than you saw with liberal, which was like half conservative in and of itself. So uh, this is a pretty good way of doing this. I'm really glad I got it to work because I was like, I was this going to going to be kind of like the centerpiece of my thing. Um, so and I can stop it as to the end. All right. So there, that, that was my little interactive thing. Thanks for playing along. Um, let me start my PowerPoint back up <laughs> because uh, it crashed. Um, hopefully this didn't erase the changes I made. Let's see now. Where was I? I was all the way back here. I was going to show you this huge regression, but I don't have time to talk about it, sadly. Let's see. Where was I? Yeah, I'm going to skip that part because I'm already over time and, I, and there's some things I want to talk about. All right. So uh, in terms of key findings, right, so who did they target? Pro-Trump conservatives, anti-Trump liberals, black activists, local news consumers, not Hillary supporters. So even though um, a lot of what uh, you know, the IRA has been portrayed to do is sort of to sow chaos and to sort of play all sides, there were certain sides that they were very unwilling to play. Um, and the number one was uh, pro-Hillary. There was very little uh, of that. Um, you, did see, you did see some pro-Bernie stuff, some pro-Jill uh, Stein stuff, but uh, almost no pro-Hillary stuff. What did they say? So topics that we're talking about include um, election 2016, pro-Trump, pro-Bernie, anti-Hillary largely, black issues, pop culture, non-political, uh, so showing how they're trying to ingratiate themselves into uh, trying to get into the information environments of folks who don't uh, primarily consume politics. Uh, also a little bit about the Middle East, um, which of course is a, a, an area of great interest to Russia given their uh, involvement in the Syrian war and in other areas. 
Um, so what worked, um, I can't really talk about that because I didn't show you the regression and also I just thought of a better way to do that. So we're going to table that temporarily and um, I can sort of discuss that during um, Q&A folks are really interested. Uh, but I'm working on it. So some broader implications. Um, so while the IRA was nonpartisan, uh, they did not cover all, all, all political bases equally, which is very important for us to remember. Um, you know, and I think that the, the, those omissions, I think, are really interesting and instructive because they show that um, not only do they aim to sow chaos, but they also are trying to push certain political agendas to the exclusion of others. And I think that's something that gets lost in this conversation sometimes. They also see uh, blacks and conservatives as prime targets, right? So people that are in this group need to be uh, aware, especially because U.S. intelligence agencies have come out and said that Russia is going to try to do this again in 2018, right? So, and also, it may not be Russia. You know, other folks may be play, uh, sort of operating from the Russian playbook. And, you know, just like any, you know, good um, military force, they strike at points of perceived weakness. And so that's what they're going to do. Um, and much of the content, interestingly, is totally innocuous, not political at all, right? like, like, that, like that joke about Brian Cranston being in a, an old Taco Bell commercial, right? So a lot of this stuff is just kind of, you know, like random kind of funny kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, you do see, you know, the, the more nefarious edge of this pop out uh, at moments of uh, political uh, import. Uh, next steps, well, so I'm going to try to get a paper out on this. Uh, any ideas about where to submit it, please let me know. I've got some ideas myself, but um, if you know of places. Because one thing I really want to do with a paper on this is get it out before the midterms, because I really do feel like people need to know about this, and I, and I want to have somebody who understands the importance of this and also generally of scholarship impacting the real world as opposed to only the people that study this. Um, I want to continue to, to theorize this information, try to understand it from an abstract perspective. I hope that the empirical work here will serve as a base for future work in this area. Um, I've got another, I've got, I want to analyze data sets that help to show how people reacted to this. That's one thing that this data set doesn't do because it's only IRA tweaks. Um, but I've got some of that and I want to be able to, to, to try to gather more. I've got some lines on how to do that. Um, and then uh, I'm also interested in looking at other state-sponsored disinformation organizations. I'm not even sure what those would be yet, um, but I'm open if anybody knows uh, of what those are and how to, and, and, um, how to get data on, on those. So. Um, it's well past six, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, and I invite any questions you may have, and thank you for your attention. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yes, you. You said that, uh, so they were catering towards black and also towards conservative. Was it the same timeline, catering to So you would see sort of like Black Lives Matter, next thing, Hillary's pro gun control, or, or is it like separate? Profiles yeah, these are these are these are separate profiles. So in other words, if you had, so let me actually back this up. Where was this? Right. So if you look at somebody like Pamela Moore, thirteen, she's on the conservative beat, right? And and so her whole identity is caught up in doing that and engaging with those folks because to be able to get the number of followers that she had, that she who knows whether it was actually a woman or not, um, that uh, that she had, uh, you have to be able to, to be continuously engaged, and that sort of network capital is something that you can't just sort of slough off and then get back. So people who were engaged in this, once they plugged into one particular community, they, t they had a tendency to stick with it. And the same for, you know, for my squad, right? They were on the, the sort of black activist beat, and so that's what they stayed with. Uh, yes? Could you elaborate, and I, this is not my own expertise, or perhaps I'm making some sure. comments, but on the assumption that the persona that a troll is, in, or a disinformation agent is impersonating will also be the, the target audience um, of how, uh, because it seems to me that a lot of content that people consume on the internet uh, provokes a strong reaction precisely because it's from a different, a sort of different identity category or point of view. Sure, yeah. Um, so that's, that's sort of based on the idea of homophily, right? So this idea that like attracts like. So that's, that's sort of the general theoretical basis that I bring to that. Um, and also, uh, you know, I, again, but that would be uh, that future strand of research that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. Uh, where I'm looking at the reactions there, uh, I'll be able to determine that a little bit uh, uh, better. Um, and then I think thirdly, I would say that um, a, lot of, a lot of the content is sort of indistinguishable from what you would see, at least from my perspective, and that's admittedly a qualitative observation. But when I look at you know, what Pamela Moore is tweeting, what 10 GOP is tweeting, that's another popular conservative um, uh, uh, you know, uh, account, um, it seems to be very similar 
to what actual people who uh, support Trump are actually saying. Uh, conversely, if you look at another popular account that I didn't show, that was sort of a black presenting account called uh, Crystal One Johnson. Like, I personally know people who followed that and were like, oh, I thought that account was really great. Turns out it's Russian propaganda. So anecdotally, there's some evidence there, but uh, obviously there does need to be more research. I think you're right to uh, support that uh, particular assumption. Yeah. Yes? What was the name of the woman in the beginning of your presentation? And did anything happen to her when she came out with her piece for journalists? Uh, apparently, the, apparently the Russian government awarded her um, damages for uh, lost wages after she was terminated. From, um, from employment after being a mole there. But it was only like $1, super, it was super symbolic. But she, was, but she said she was satisfied. So um, I'm not sure where, where, where she ended up, uh, whether she left. Her name is um, Ludmilla Sabchuk. Uh, I can get that spelling for you if you really need it. Um, yeah, so she, uh, that's, that's who she is. And I can get you this article as well that I got this picture from too. So, other questions? Yes? Do you have any idea what tools Twitter used to try to identify which that's a great question, and no, it's a trade secret. So that is one like major criticism against this. However, apparently uh, it was uh, it was enough to, to convince uh, you know the, the House Intelligence Committee and Robert Mueller, who uh, went after these folks. And so on a certain level, we have to take that on on uh, on faith. However, uh, I think that so so the government um, engagement with this is one point in favor of that. Another is the fact that I don't think I, I actually looked around for this. I don't think that anyone claimed to be an owner of that account. In other words, that their account was um, incorrectly shut down as being uh, a Russian account. Now there was, a woman who, a, 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 there was a woman who claimed that that was the case, but it turned out that her claim was actually not, was actually without merit. So um, the absence of people coming, coming, coming out and saying, I was, people said I was you know, a member of the IRA, but I really wasn't, I think, is, is also telling them. But, but yeah, I think that they sort of treat that as a trade secret. They say, well, if we reveal how we did that, then that helps them evade you know, our, our, uh, our, our techniques there. One of the problems is on Twitter, there's no way to flag, I suspect this is a, this is a Russian disinformation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like spam, but that doesn't really quite accurately uh, yeah. describe what this is. Yeah, and there, there, are, some, there are some accounts. There's a, um, there's a project that's funded by the uh, German Marshall Fund that tries to track uh, uh, Russian bots that are still active. Um, I don't think they're affiliated with the, the, with the IRA, but they've got, you know, they look at things like, um, you know, are they active during the day, daylight hours in Moscow, St. Petersburg, St. Petersburg? Do they use things like, um, what is it, like a, a certain, um, certain solecisms that are particular to, uh, to uh, Russian language, right? So that's uh, in English, in terms of English translation, that's another way that, they, that, that sometimes that's done. Um, but yeah, we, we're not exactly sure, and that's definitely uh, a point of criticism, I think. Yes? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because it seems like things that could clearly be bots some have very few followers, and some have thousands. Right. So, so one of the things. So the vast majority of the accounts, the the the, you know, the, 20, the over twenty seven hundred, um, very, most of them had very few followers, but there were a few that had a lot of followers. So, ten GOP had a lot. They got lots of retweets. You can see here, you know, another, one exact one example of that is if you take a really close close look at these ones, right? So Pamela Moore is getting hundreds of retweets per tweet. Um, but if you look at Robbie Delaware, he's getting nothing. Like one like here, very little is going on here. Um, uh, here, even though Cleveland Online has 13.8 uh, thousand followers, if you look at these tweets, not a whole lot of reaction here. Um, and then um, for my squad, it's got a little bit, four, nine, four, six, but uh, certainly uh, less than us. So yeah, they did differ a lot in popularity. Yes? So how could, how could they have ever gotten 13,000? That is an excellent empirical question, which I uh, aim to, to answer for you. Can't you buy followers? Uh, you can buy followers, but um, what, what, like, a good question would be, what would be the point? I mean, if you're, you're going to buy your followers, you, um, the, the, the goal of any, I mean, th this, is, this is sort of taken from sort of traditional propaganda, from traditional disinformation theory. Um, the goal is to reach real people. So um, and if you were going to buy followers, why not buy them for all of your accounts? Why would you leave all of your accounts uh, with zero followers or very small numbers of followers? Why not make them all 10,000? It's really cheap. You can do it for very little money. So the fact that uh, there were so many of these accounts that had a few followers tells me that the ones that actually hit um, had significant, probably had significant numbers of real people that were following them. Yes? So this is probably a hard, maybe not fair question, but I think in the beginning of last year, you talked about the different areas of research 
Right. Right now, it's just like a definitional, conceptual case that is data driven. Right. And I think there's there's another step that that sometimes touches on all three of those areas, which is how much impact does this actually have? Sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there is one school of thought that's like we're focusing on the impact this information has because that's sort of easier than focusing on like the bigger breakdown, uh, you know, society that might have led to certain results in the election and things like that. Sure. And you know, my feeling is that there's always a little bit of all of these things that are interacting together. So do people like <coughs> you talk to the people who are doing that studies and seeing where the overlaps are and how they inform each other, like the specifics of how it works, and then actually what impact? Right. Well, so I, uh, in the in the future research that I aim to do, I will uh, address that impact question directly. I can sort of look at that when I'm considering the number of retweets that um, uh, that these messages got. So that's one sort of very small way that I can get at that. Um, you know, to the general question of impact, I would say that um, uh, you know, so yes, maybe it's true that like you know, Russian bots didn't sway the election, right? I mean, that's I think I think I'm, I'm probably you know. I mean, I've done all the research, but like I'm, I'm pretty comfortable saying that. Um, but you know, this is only you know uh, the epistemological you know situation in which we find ourselves is one that is very you know vulnerable to this kind of manipulation. And just because it hasn't worked before doesn't mean that a more refined, more sophisticated version of this couldn't work in the future. So uh, th there's that piece. Then there's also the piece that with electoral margins being as thin as they are. It doesn't take a whole lot of nudging to like flip things in another direction. So um, I think that even those possibilities make this worthy of study. Uh, and so, and I also think, just generally speaking, that there's a whole lot of stuff to study, and people can study the things that they want to study, uh, as long as they can make a case for it. And I think the case for this is uh, is pretty strong, especially when you consider um, the implications of what might happen if they succeed in a really big way. Yes. How can we better spot fake news? I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I, I taught an undergrad class on this uh, last semester, and um, you know, really, uh, the only way to spot fake news, or one of the best ways to spot fake news, is through uh, consensus, right? So finding corroborating sources, being uh, using the skills that journalists use every day, but and also accepting that that's never going to be perfect, right? So even professional journalists get hoodwinked on occasion, right? But I think it's also important to consider, you know, the uh, the converse, right? So going so far toward the realm of, um, you know, paranoia, that you sort of see agent provocateurs everywhere you look, and that's one potential effect of the IRA's revelation, right? Because now, you know, I've even started doing this. Like, look, wow, could this person be some kind of foreign agent if they're, you know, tweeting in a way that seems a little bit off? You know, I've started sort of looking at my social media feeds a little bit differently because of this. And so that's a sort of second order effect that I think this might have. Um, and uh, you can also generalize that to the fake news phenomenon. I'm not a huge fan of that term, but um, you know, if you want to use it, uh, I think there is a sense in which now you, know, you look at things that seem like a little bit off, and you're like, could this be fake? Is this really real? Um, but I think, and the last thing I'll say about it is you have to, give, you have to uh, be willing to suspend judgment, right? And a willing, you have to have a willingness to apply um, provisional acceptance and a willingness to revoke that uh, upon the revelation of future, you know, facts that are not presently at light, um, and to be okay with that, right? You know, it's like in science, right? Everything is provisional, right? Anything could be overturned with, you know, some, you know, additional evidence, and so and so it is with news and information that uh, have to do with politics. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking about how the first stories, even like how journalists and the stories were sort of like this is a thing. I was thinking of how the the bot, the, well, the spear use Twitter account for electoral use has been spotted in other contexts. I'm from Mexico, and so right. in 2012, this was the whole thing. It was because you would see in like trending topics, you would see these same tweets tweeted by like a bunch of different accounts. I mean, of course, it was super not sophisticated. Sure. That's how people could smell it. Right. And that's how it became a thing, and it got even framed not as trolls, but as bots. Right. And so it's like an easy to recognize phenomenon. So I'm thinking, if you have regular looking accounts that are sort of built with their own personas, how did someone initially suspect that there was something off about and, and, and like a concerted effort? Well, uh, again, uh, the initial reports on this were actually sourced by um, moles in the organization, right? So, so moles, ex-employees, uh, uh, ex and so before they actually spot, remember the first um, 
stories on this come out in 2014. We don't realize who these folks are until the end of 2017. So, you know, there was sort of the stories circulating around that there are these Russian, this Russian organization out there sort of tweeting. We don't know who exactly they are. Twitter leaves the accounts up. Facebook leaves the accounts up. You know, they buy all these ads. They post all this, you know, fake, you know, sort of grassroots looking stuff. Uh, and so it did take some time. It did, it did take time, you know, from the first stories that started to emerge in 2014 to uh, the revelation of those accounts at the end of 2017. Um, and I think how they knew about it was uh, the insiders that actually came out and uh, provided the documentation uh, of this, which was corroborated by a number of journalists. So, so yeah, I mean, I, n this was not instantaneous by any means, yeah. Speaking of journalists, you spoke in the beginning, you referred to a New York Times reporter. Yeah. Uh, that, so the New York Times piece, the major New York Times piece came out in 2015. That was by Adrian Shem. The 2014 piece was in BuzzFeed. And I give you, the, I actually have that guy's name if you want that. Uh, la, 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 la. Where was that? That was on the, that was on the thing with the big, yes. Yeah, so th that's uh, Max Sedon, S-E-D-D-O-N, um, who wrote the BuzzFeed piece in 2014, which was the first, as far as I can tell, major English language piece describing uh, the IRA and its activities. So Adrian Shem. Masha guest on well on NPR this morning uh, saying that they believe the Russian meddling uh, hype is overblown and that it, Interesting. And that it wasn't. And Masha Gessen is obviously very anti Putin and yeah. you know, is, a, is a very well known anti Russia writer. Yeah. For Russian herself, and having escaped Andrew, and Adrian Chen, as we know as well, and they were both saying it's, it's now been overblown. They should do the research. That's what I'm trying to do, right? So, I mean, it's, you know, uh, we all know people who make claims without a, the empirical evidence to support it, right? This data, this data became uh, public very, very recently. And so, um, and even if that's true, you know, that's not to say that this could, again, that's not to say that, that this couldn't happen again, right? Like they, just to clarify, what they were saying was not that there isn't a lot of Russian propaganda or misinformation or disinformation, but that uh, they think it's next to impossible to believe that an actual Oh yeah, no, I, I totally agree with yeah, that, right? So that. yeah, so I, I I completely agree with that. I mean, but I would I would argue that um, its importance doesn't turn on that particular yeah, fact. I so, uh, I, but I but I, I've seen that frame happen a lot, right? So people say, oh, it didn't affect the election, so who cares, right? Well, there's a lot of reasons to care, right? There's the fact that Russia is not done. There's the fact that other states could do this. There's the fact that people might want to know that folks are out there, you know, trying to manipulate their opinion for. Uh, surreptitious, uh, you know, re uh, reasons of um, you know, international relations dealing dealing with foreign states, right? So I think that, um, and as far as the impact goes, uh, it's interesting and I think valuable to try to figure out, um, even if overall the effect is low, the effect could have been stronger among certain populations, right? So looking at the overall effect, I think is somewhat misleading. Um, when this was a targeted operation, we know that there were specific groups that were. Um, uh, that were that were at the, the the business end of that. So, you know, um, I mean, that point I think is is certainly valid, but I, I wouldn't take it too far. Yes. Where are you considering publishing the work? You said you wanted to get it out before the election. Yeah. But most academic journals are about a year turnaround. So yeah. So that, that's not going to happen. So uh, I'm hoping, and I don't, and so this is you know like, I'm hoping to prevail upon the uh, good graces of a journal editor who uh, sees the value of getting this out in relatively short order. So uh, my pitch is basically like, this is, you know, this is important, you know. And somebody who believes that um, uh, peer-reviewed work has a role, um, or at least some peer-reviewed work, has a role to instruct and inform the public, right? Some journal letters are like, well, I only do this for my own little, you know, community of, of, of practice and community of research, uh, and that's fine, but there are others who say, well, I want my research to have an impact. I want my research to have an impact beyond the field, especially when the topic is so important. So um, really, I'm just going to look for folks. And I'll, I've been in contact. I've been in contact with some journal editors. Um, and some of them have uh, expressed some interest. But I'm trying to figure out, I mean, obviously, you know, due to the nature of peer review, there are no guarantees. And I'm not going to ask for that. But um, you know, somebody who, under the right circumstances, might be willing to uh, you know, send it to some of their faster reviewers and you know, um, and try to uh, do do what they can within the um, the restrictions of peer review to you know like for example speed up the production process or something like that. So would you consider doing two versions, one that went to a scholarly journal, one that went to say the Atlantic Monthly? Yeah, so that might be, and then one that might be one way to go about it would be to try to find somebody 
uh, like a journalist or something who could co-write this with me. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be worth uh, worth doing. And so, um, yeah, I could think about I could think about doing that. I actually have a colleague who did something very similar, so I may I may uh, uh, do that. But um, yeah, that will depend on how the discussions go. We'll see. Yes. Um, yeah, I had a, a question around just your thoughts about <coughs> the specific strategy, this disinformation strategy within the context of the 2016 election. Yep. Like the effects it had in terms of like, you mentioned that they had agendas that were somewhat contradictory. Yep. But it seems like there was an emphasis on like installing a sympathetic regime, whether or not that was successful or not. Um, mm -hmm. And I was just curious your thoughts in terms of like a broader context of imperialism. Was this like more oriented towards regime change as you would see it, or like just exacerbating a situation of political polarization in general? Well, I think really the answer is both, right? Because on the one hand, you had, so really the only sort of uh, consistent through line was, was like, we don't like Hillary, right? So there's pro Bernie stuff, there's pro Jill Stein stuff, there was pro Trump stuff. There was uh, stuff about how terrible cops were. There was stuff about how great cops were. So there, was th there were things that were directly contradictory, but the only thing they really didn't seem to touch at all on the election, major issues in terms of the election, was um, they never, almost never posted anything that was pro Hillary. So um, it may have been oriented toward regime change. Um, you know, uh, they, say, they say a lot about you know, sowing chaos, trying to uh, provoke uh, polarization. Um, part of the difficulty is it's very difficult to um, infer intent outside of the data to which we have access. And the data themselves are weird, right? I mean, they're just like, it's, it's, it's hard to make sense of them. And so um, part of this process is, I mean, I'm glad you're asking these questions, but I'm trying to figure out a frame to put on this that helps make some sense out of what they were trying to do. But I'm also a little bit wary of like, you know, being, being a little bit too sort of, uh, inferring more than is warranted on the basis of the data that I have. So, yes? Has anybody looked at uh, the possibility that they were simply doing research? Uh, I suppose that's possible. Uh, you know, the, uh, the name Internet Research Agency itself is somewhat Aurelian, right? So, I mean, if you, if you accept the premise that what they were doing was spreading propaganda. Uh, I mean, but they've made huge investments in media generally, and they've stated that they're going to compete with Western media toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Right. And, and they view our media as doing to them what we're talking about, their media doing to us. So such a small-scale thing as this, I wonder if it isn't just poking around and seeing what happens. Well, um, I mean, I, I suppose there's no reason it couldn't be both, right? So if it has an impact, you know, fantastic. We are uh, fulfilling that disinformation role in terms of um, visiting harm upon enemies and uh, benefits upon the source. Uh, but, you know, I would assume that to whatever extent that's true, it's an iterative process. So and we certainly saw that over the course of the, uh, um, uh, of, of the IRA's activity period over these three years, right? So um, I'm pretty sure, I, I need to do this analysis, but I'm pretty sure that the rate of retweets went up a lot simply because of the election. So they were able to learn, uh, I mean, one might infer at least, that they were able to learn what worked. Uh, and also, I just, some, some conversations on a mailing list that I'm on, this fake news mailing list, said that, the, that, there, that before the IRA started, there was um, a Russian sort of media analytics firm that pinpointed the most divisive issues that then was fed into um, uh, 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 the process of generating identities for these accounts. So um, there was certainly some research on the front end, if that source can be believed. Um, and I can only assume that whatever sort of analytics they were looking at on the social media end was then cycled back into uh, the operations that they did to try to improve and try to try to try to get more reactions out of folks. But, but again, right, like I'm, I'm only on this side of it, so I have no idea. Maybe one last question, or maybe we're done. Anybody else? Which is totally fine. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>